Today's topic is the Michelson interferometer, a very important optical system, and what that can tell us about the temporal coherence of an optical source. In fact, it'll allow us to define what we mean by the temporal coherence of an optical source. So far, we have concerned ourselves with monochromatic light. And this would be the case where the electric field, vector E of x, y, z, and time, takes the form of the real part of a constant polarization vector E0 times a scalar field G of x, y, and z, and a single frequency component E to the minus i 2 pi nu t. So this is the phasor concept. If you have sinusoidal behavior at a single frequency, you can then write it as a phasor times e to the minus i 2 pi nu t and take the real part. What do we do if we have non-monochromatic light, where we will write that E of x, y, z, and t we'll still assume that there's a constant polarization vector E0 so that we're not worrying about polarization effects times a scalar field G of x, y, z, and t. Right? So this is a more general scalar field than we had in the monochromatic case. This can have any arbitrary frequency components in it. So how do we deal with a non-monochromatic field? Suppose we have Here's our optical axis, and this is a plane. Um, Z is equal to Z1, and we've got some field there. So that would be, let's call that G of X, Y, Z1, and T. And we want to figure out how that propagates out to a field in the plane Z is equal to Z2. And that's going to be g of x, y, z2, and t. So this is a, a difficult problem. Now, in principle, what we could do is take the field at the input plane, z is equal to z1, and at any point x and y, well, we just have a function of time, and we could fully transform that to get g sub nu 1 of x and y is a Fourier transform of g of x, y, z1, and time e to the i 2 pi nu t dt. And now that's the spectrum. And it, for a given value of nu, well, this will correspond to the phasor amplitude in a monochromatic field. It's just that the non-monochromatic field then is made up of a superposition of many different monochromatic fields. So for a single one of those monochromatic fields, we already know how to propagate that between two planes. It's just the Fresnel formula. diffraction integral. So we propagate each, well, first, we calculate all these monochromatic components of this non-monochromatic field. We propagate each one of those monochromatic components using the Fresnel diffraction formula. And then we superimpose those results. We recombine them to get G of X, Y, Z2, and time is equal to an inverse Fourier transform of g nu 2 of x, y, e to the minus i, 2 pi nu t, d nu. 
that we could use all the techniques we've developed to deal with non-monochromatic light. We just have to add these Fourier transform and inverse Fourier transform steps. That would work in theory. In fact, here it is. We just laid out the theory right there. Uh, but this really does not work in practice. And the difficulty is, in order to do this Fourier transform, we would have to know exactly the time variation of the field at every point in space, at least in the plane z is equal to z1. So for all x and y, we'd have to know precisely this oscillation. And it won't be the same oscillation in general. All right? That's what differs from the monochromatic case, where everything has the same frequency, single frequency. Uh, and optical frequencies are on the order of 10 to the 14th, 10 to the 15th hertz, so a million billion hertz. There's just no way we can practically um, track variations on that order. Uh, and so we have to look for what we can do. And generally, we're limited to making statements about the statistics of the oscillations rather than precisely what the oscillations are. And this leads us into the realm of statistical optics. And the two subfields of that we're going to look at are so-called temporal coherence and later spatial coherence. So now let's look at the Michelson interferometer, which allows us to quantify the statistical properties of a source. And at the heart of the Michelson interferometer is a device called a beam splitter. And this is the symbol for it. Looks like a cube with a diagonal here. That diagonal is a so-called partially silvered mirror. It's a partially reflective mirror. And so if we bring a beam in, say, from the left, that beam will hit that partially silvered surface, and roughly half of it will be reflected and go upward, and the other half will be transmitted and go rightward. So that is a beam splitter. So with the beam splitter at its heart, Michelson interferometer looks something like this. So we've got a source here, which we assume is a point source oscillating with an amplitude g of t. So that's our optical source. And we have a mirror, and, uh, I'm sorry, a lens, right, rather. Uh, and of course, we have the partially silvered mirror in the beam splitter. And so that source is going to create a spherical wave, which we assume is collimated into a plane wave by the lens. And then that goes into the beam splitter. Half of that is reflected upwards. And we assume that there is a mirror there. Well, this mirror M1, it is a movable mirror, so it can be translated up and down. So, and then the other half of the incident field on the beam splitter goes to the right. Let's see here. And that strikes a mirror. Mirror M2, which is fixed. And we assume that the uh, distance from the center of the beam splitter to the mirror M2 is D2, a fixed value. And from the center of the beam splitter to mirror M1 will be a distance D1, which we'll write as D2 minus H. So H will be the difference in distance between these two arms. Up here, we'll 
we'll call this arm one and down here arm two of the interferometer so half of the incident field goes up here to m1 is reflected comes back down and half of that will pass through the beam splitter and the other half of the incident field goes is transmitted over here to mirror m2 reflected off and half of that will be reflected at the beam splitter and so then these two components from the two arms will then combine and form a total field which then comes down is focused by a lens and falls on a detector and the field at that detector we'll assume is g sub d of t and what we primarily will be actually observing will be the intensity i sub d uh, and that will be a function of this position of the movable mirror relative to the fixed mirror okay so this is basic layout of the michelson interferometer we take a source and we break it into two parts and by moving the movable mirror we can change the time delay between those two paths between the two arms of the interferometer such that when they come and combine at the detector what we're going to get is g sub d of t is going to be equal to now there's of course going to be some loss in amplitude when you break these up into two paths uh, and plus fresnel losses from the lenses and the front surface of the beam splitter and you're going to have you know two transits through the partially silvered mirror etc but we'll just neglect all those global um, changes in amplitude we're only interested in the relative amplitudes of these two components that come from the two arms here so let's assume that the total time delay through the common part of the interferometer that's from the source to the beam splitter and from the beam splitter to the detector is sometime t0 so then the detector field amplitude will be g of t minus t0 so the source minus this time delay and then for arm two with the fixed arm you'll have minus two um, d2 one way distance and so two times that is the round trip distance over the speed of light and for the other arm you have g t minus t0 minus well that'll be 2 d1 that's for the field that goes up here 2 d1 over c but d1 is d2 minus h so that'll be 2 d2 minus h over c and again neglecting any overall global changes to the amplitudes we're just interested in the relative uh, amplitudes which we assume that if this is a perfectly 50 percent uh, beam splitter uh, it exactly splits the amplitude of the incident field uh, these will have the same relative amplitude okay so let's define let's shift the time axis by defining or replacing t by t plus t0 um, plus 2 g2 over c so that when we put that in here these two terms will go away and let's define tau is 2h over c it's going to come over from this term minus minus 2h over c then we're, what we're going to get is that at the detector the field amplitude is going to be okay so this first term just becomes g of t when we make the substitution and over here it's going to be g of t and the only difference is we're going to have minus minus or plus 2h over c which is tau so g of t plus g of t plus tau in other words the michelson interferometer what it does is it takes a source oscillation g of t and then gives us at the detector the sum of that source oscillation plus a delayed version of it advanced or delayed depending on whether tau is positive or negative and then what we're actually able to look at because this thing will have oscillations on the order of 10 to the 15th hertz we're actually able to look at 
only the intensity. This will be a function of this relative displacement h. And in fact, that will be a time average intensity. where by this time average operation with the angle brackets, if we have a function f of t, we define that to be the limit as big T goes to infinity, the averaging time of one over t, the integral from minus t over two, t over two, f of t dt. Okay, so time averaged. Or we could say the time average intensity. So that's what we're going to be looking at. How then can we relate this time average intensity to the statistical properties of the source? Let's look at this illustration, uh, animation of the behavior of a Michelson interferometer. Here is your source, beam splitter, two mirrors, and detector. And so the source produces an oscillation, which propagates out, is split by the beam splitter into two paths. Each of those two arms of the interferometer cause that beam to reflect, and then they come back and they're recombined in the beam splitter. And then they come down to the detector, and we observe the time average intensity at the detector. Now, if... Um, one, or as shown here, both of the mirrors were to move, it would cause a change in the total path distance in that corresponding arm. And so if that ends up giving you a difference, relative difference in the path length of the two arms, then the two beams that recombine will have a different phase shift relative to each other. And that can cause the beams to go from destructive to constructive interference or vice versa. So that's why moving, uh, in our case, we'll just be looking at one of the mirrors moving. If we move one of the mirrors, that's going to allow us to look at interference fringes resulting from this interference of these two delayed beams, right, where the motion of one of the mirrors relative to the other causes that delay, the relative delay, to change. The intensity at the detector, the time average intensity, is the time average of the magnitude of g of t plus g of t plus tau. So these are the two components of the field that have gone through the two different arms of the interferometer. They have a relative time delay tau. We look at the intensity of that, magnitude squared, and time average it. And what is that? That is the time average of the field, g of t plus g of t plus tau times its conjugate, g of t conjugate plus g of t plus tau conjugate, that product, and time averaged. So that's going to have four terms. The first one will be uh, g of t times g conjugate. So that's the time average of the magnitude of g of t squared. And then we'll have g of t plus tau times its conjugate. So that'll be the time average of the magnitude of g of t plus tau squared. And then we'll have the cross terms. We'll have a g of t plus tau times g conjugate of t. And then we're going to have the conjugate of that. We'll have g of t times g of t plus tau conjugated. All right, let's make some definitions now. This magnitude of g 
uh, t squared time average that's just the intensity of one of the beams if you blocked the other beam now if we block the, the movable mirror beam arm now this term would go away we just have all these three terms would go away we just have this first term and so we'll call that i zero that would be the intensity of the field if you blocked one of the beams and of course if you blocked the beam in the fixed mirror and just had the movable mirror beam well that would give you the same intensity this is just an offset uh, in time version of this beam and since you're taking the magnitude squared and time averaging it doesn't matter if you offset it in time you get the same intensity so i zero is the intensity of either of the beams if you block the other arm of the interferometer and now this term right here let's define big gamma of tau be so by definition this time average g of t plus tau times g conjugate of t and we're going to call that the self coherence function self coherence function and in terms of those definitions then the time average intensity at the detector is a function of the movable mirror displacement h where remember here we're talking about h and tau those are related by tau is is 2h over c that is going to be equal then to, to here's i zero here's another i zero so we've got two i zeros and then here we've got gamma of tau, and then this is just the conjugate of that. So that's going to be gamma of tau plus gamma conjugate of tau. And we can write that as factor it out 2. So we have 2 times i0. And a complex number or expression plus its conjugate is just 2 times the real part of that expression. So we've already factored out the 2 here, so that'll just leave the real part of gamma of tau. Now it's convenient uh, to factor out the I zero, the overall intensity of the beam. We'll factor that out in front, and of course then that'll leave one plus the real part of gamma of tau over I zero. And that leads us to define a new function, little gamma of tau, to be equal to big gamma of tau over I zero. So just normalized by the uh, intensity of the beam in one of the arms. And I zero, well, let's look at our big gamma of tau if we let tau is equal to zero here we just get g of t times g conjugate of t that's just magnitude of g squared so we can also write this as big gamma of tau over big gamma of zero so this is a normalized version of the self-coherence function and that is called the complex degree of coherence. Now suppose our source oscillation g of t has the form of some constant a times e to the minus i 2 pi nu zero t. Well that would be a monochromatic source. So let's see what we get for our complex degree of coherence and interferometer intensity when we have a monochromatic source. Well, in that case, I0, the magnitude of G squared time average would just be the magnitude of A squared. Big gamma of tau would be time average of G of t plus tau, so that would be a, um, e to the minus i, 2 pi, nu zero, t plus 
tau times the conjugate of g, which would be a conjugate, e to the plus i, 2 pi nu zero t. And let's see, we would have an a times a conjugate, that's the magnitude of a squared. Here you've got e to the plus i, 2 pi nu zero t, and here you've got an e to the minus i, 2 pi nu zero t. Those are conjugates and they cancel out to give you just product is equal to one, and that just leaves then e to the minus i, 2 pi nu zero tau. And so if we divide that by i, I zero, well, that just gets rid of the magnitude a squared, and we see that our complex degree of coherence, little gamma of tau, is just e to the minus i, 2 pi nu zero tau. And our detector intensity as a function of the relative displacement of the movable mirror would be 2 i0, 1 plus the real part of this, which is just cosine of 2 pi nu zero tau, which we can write as 2 i0, 1 plus the cosine of 2 pi. And now let's put in that tau. Remember that the tau is 2h over c. So the over c will get nu zero over c. Frequency over the speed of light is 1 over the wavelength. So that's 1 over lambda. And this factor of 2 in the numerator, we're going to express that by putting an one half in the denominator so lambda zero over two and then we have h up top all right so what does this uh this look like this is h and this is our id of h um Then when h is equal to zero, this is one plus one, two times two is four, so we get four i zero. And as h uh, increases, well, when it gets to be half of this, so it's lambda zero over four, this becomes a one half times two pi is just pi, cosine of pi is minus one, one minus one is zero. So we get, Here, this will be at uh, lambda zero over four, and this will be lambda zero over two. Of course, when h goes to lambda zero over two, then this is just cosine of two pi, which is back to one. And so we get back to this uh, same value. So we get something that looks like this. I didn't draw that very well. It should go all the way down to zero here. So these variations of bright and weak or dark um, signals here we call interference fringes. And so we see that we see go through an, a complete interference fringe when we move the mirror half of a wavelength. And in fact, this technique between um, 1960 and 1983 was how the meter was defined. The meter, one meter was defined to be 1,650,000 Seven hundred and sixty-three point seven three wavelengths of a particular Krypton eighty-six atom atomic transition. So, I'll put this particular uh, a light source that's based on this particular transition of this Krypton atom as your input to the Michelson interferometer, 
count out 1,650,763.73 um, wavelengths obtained because every, every wavelength is of displacement is going to give you two of these fringes. And then that's one meter by definition. So for a monochromatic source, we would see interference fringes, where a period of that would be half a wavelength. And now let's define the fringe visibility, big V, to be the max of this detector intensity minus the minimum over the sum of those. Max plus min. So in our case, for a monochromatic source, this is 2i0, 1 plus the cosine of 2 pi h over lambda 0 over 2. And so our visibility would be, well, the max of this is when cosine is equal to 1. This is then 1 plus 1 is 2 times 2 is 4 i0. The minimum is when the cosine is minus 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. And so in this case, of course, this is just equal to 1. And we will define that to be characteristic of coherent light, a fringe visibility of one. And conversely, we'll eventually get to talking about totally incoherent light. That will be where the fringe visibility is equal to zero. We'll call that incoherent light. And then in between, when V is something greater than zero but less than one, we'll call that partially coherent light. All right, so incoherent light, well, that would be the case where the intensity would just be, say, 2i0. Uh, this term here would be gone. There would be no oscillations. So, for example, the white light that characterizes uh, quite well the sunlight in our natural environment is incoherent. And that's why we don't see uh, interference effects in our day-to-day -day world. We actually have to use special light sources like lasers that are highly coherent in order to see these kinds of interference effects. So later we will talk about the effects of partial coherence on optical systems. But for now, we're just trying to basically uh, come up with a description, a quantitative description of the coherence properties of light. All right. so in this case, for the incoherent light, right, if the, if the intensity of the output of the interferometer is always constant, well, then V would just be... 2i0 is the max, 2i0 is the min, and obviously that numerator then is zero. And then in between, you're going to have some partial coherence properties. Now let's mix things up a little bit, and let's have a source that is monochromatic, e to the minus i 2 pi nu 0 t, but we turn it on and off periodically. So times the sum, n equals minus infinity to infinity, rect of t minus n t sub r over t sub p. 
is a pulsed source. And so this would look something like following. Make that a little bit longer. And that would be the envelope. And then the actual oscillations, say, would be something like this. And in between those pulses, there's no field. P here in the denominator is the pulse period. That's the duration for a single pulse. And then TR, that's the repetition period. And right here in the middle would be TR over 2. Okay, so our gamma of tau, G of T plus tau g conjugate of t so we take this expression conjugate it that's our g conjugate and then another version of the expression that's been shifted along the time axis by tau and we can see this is periodic this this these pulses go on forever and ever both in positive and negative uh, times so if we shift this uh, we shift it by a full period well then we just get back to the exact same expression so the this is going to be periodic with the same period t sub r. So we only need to look at this over one period. So that would be magnitude of tau, or yeah, magnitude of tau less than or equal to the repetition period over two. So what do we get in that case? Uh, let's see, we're going to get gamma of tau is going to be equal to, so this term here, we're going to get e to the minus i, 2 pi nu, nu zero t plus tau. That's from the g of t plus tau. And then for the g conjugate, we're going to get e to the plus i, 2 pi nu zero t. And then we only need to um, average this over one period because it's a periodic function. So if you average over any number of periods, it's equal to the average over one period. So that would be one over TR, integral from minus TR over two to TR over two of rect. So we just do this for the little n is equal to zero. And uh, rect of T plus tau over tp times rect of t over tp. Integrate that dt. So what does that, uh, that integral look like? Obviously up here, the, the plus nu zero t is going to cancel the minus nu zero t. Uh, but then for this, this function here, it looks something like the following. So there is your uh, rect t over tp. So this goes from minus tp over 2 to plus tp over 2 and has a magnitude of 1 over that. And then this is going to be a shifted version. So this is going to be shifted. Uh, if tau is positive, this is going to be shifted in the minus t direction so that t plus tau is equal to 0. If tau is positive, t would have to be negative. So that's going to look something like this.
I'm making this look a little taller just so we can distinguish these two. They both have amplitude of one. So that would be shifting uh, to, this would be TP over two minus tau. And this would be, here would be minus TP over two minus tau. And where those overlap, that's where you would get a non-zero integrand here. And they would overlap. Um, over a distance of TP. If tau is equal to zero, they overlap over the entire pulse period TP. And then as tau increases, well, then you subtract off tau. So we can write this, that integral there as TP. That's if tau is equal to zero, they had overlap over the full interval TP. So the integral would be TP and we got a one over TR here. And that would be then 1 minus the magnitude of tau over Tp. So as tau in increases or decreases, but increases in absolute value, you either shift this red curve to the left or to the right, you get less overlap all the way till if you shift it so that this side goes all the way over here, that's a shift of Tp, then you go down to zero. So it would look something like this, 1 minus the absolute value of tau over Tp. Now for that, we have to assume that uh, TR is greater than or equal to 2TP here. So in other words, this uh, zero space in between is, a, is at least a pulse period so that if, when we shift this guy, this red curve, it doesn't start to overlap another one of the pulses that's over here to the left or to the right. So if we assume that, then this is what that that integral looks like. Uh, and then it's periodic, so periodic with period TR over two. It is convenient to define the triangle function, big lambda of X, as one minus the absolute value of X for the absolute value of X is less than or equal to one and zero when the absolute value of x is greater than one. This is the triangle function. We've got a rect function and now a triangle function. And in terms of that, our gamma of tau is e to the minus i two pi U zero tau is the, the T terms and that exponential canceled out. Uh, and then TP over TR rectangle function of tau over TP. And this is for the absolute value of tau is less than or equal to TR over two. And of course, then it's periodic. So for arbitrary tau, which is 2h over c, which means that h is equal to c tau over 2, we can write gamma of tau is e to the minus i 2 pi u0 tau tp over TR sum n equals minus infinity to infinity triangle function tau minus n TR over T E. Right, so this is just the triangle function, which then is just repeated every T sub R, both for positive and negative times. We just have an infinite repetition of those. And the detector intensity, I d of h, will be 2 i0. That's the real part of this capital gamma of tau. And what will that look like? That will look something. Like the following. Say this is zero here.
and this is TR over two and minus ER over two. Let's see. So that would be the envelope due to those lambda functions. And then within that, you'd have these fringes right, due to this term there, that factor in between, B0. And so this would be your 2i0. And let's see, what would the peak uh, be? Well, that would be right here. So that would be 2 times i0 plus, well, the maximum of this is when this uh, triangle function is 1. So that'd be tp over tr. So that'd be 2i0, 1 plus tp over tr. And this minimum here, there, well, that would be then when the uh, the real part of the gamma, which would then give you the cosine of this guy, that cosine would be minus one. That be here you get two i zero one minus t p over t r. So that's what the so-called interferogram would look like. The intensity of the field at the detector the, of the uh, time average intensity of it um, as a function of the time delay between the two arms of the interferometer, which again, right, is related to the uh, displacement of the movable mirror. So this would be a field that would look partially coherent at some times and incoherent at other times. So it would have coherence properties that would change in, with respect to this offset tau. So for one period, magnitude of tau less than or equal to tr over 2, the max time average intensity at the detector is going to be 2 i0, 1, plus the amplitude of the cosine term, which would be tp over tr, triangle function of tau over tp and that's for the uh, cosine would be plus one the cosine comes from the real part of e to the minus i two pi nu zero tau and then the min will just be when the cosine is minus one and that'll just give you a minus sign in the same expression So what is the visibility? The visibility is the max minus the min. So the difference of these, let's see, so the two i zeros will cancel. You get this minus minus uh, itself. So that'll be two times, so two times two i zero. We four i zero, tp over tr, triangle function of tau over tp. And the denominator will be the sum of these. Well, these two have different signs. They'll cancel. You just get 2i0 plus itself. That'll be over 4i0. And of course, that then, the 4i0s cancel. You get tp, the pulse period, over tr, the repetition period. Triangle function 
of tau over tp, which we could also express as tp over tr triangle function of h over c tp over 2, where we just use the fact that tau is 2h over c, and the 2 we write as 1 over a half. So that just shows you that um, you'd go from the maximum value of TP over TR to zero when H went from zero to CTP over two. And this would look something like following. This is zero. And if this is TP, and this is minus TP, and this is tr and this is minus tr then that would look like this zero here and then have this triangle function this is the visibility of the fringes so uh, the maximum value here would be TP over TR so it never gets up to one and it then drops down as you go as uh, tau goes to the plus or minus TP then it's zero for a while and then you it repeats okay so this would be the visibility now which is a function of the time delay tau or equivalently you could say the visibility is a function of the displacement of the movable mirror h so we've just seen an example um, of a source a pulse source where the coherence properties are a function of the time delay tau and so let's now kind of generalize this idea to what we'll call quasi-monochromatic light, almost monochromatic light. Let's assume our complex degree of coherence, that's our normalized version of the self-coherence function, gamma of tau. Um, we can certainly always write, no matter what that is, write that in polar format as the magnitude of gamma times e to the minus i a phase, phi of tau. And then the detector intensity will be 2 i0, 1, plus the real part of little gamma of tau, which would be the magnitude of gamma of tau e to the minus i phi of tau. So that's certainly always possible to do. We haven't made any assumptions there. But specifically for quasi-monochromatic light, we're going to assume that this has a center frequency new zero so that we can write the phase phi of tau as two pi new zero tau that's what would be precisely if this was monochromatic with frequency new zero but if it's not monochromatic then we'll add a little additional phase chains alpha of tau and if the signal has a bandwidth, some range of frequencies delta nu, which is much, much less than the center frequency, so it's so-called narrow band signal, then we would expect that the magnitude of gamma of tau and this alpha of tau very slowly. 
solely with respect to the variation of the 2 pi nu zero tau. So if that's the case, then we would be able to write, rewrite this as ID of H is equal to two I zero one plus the magnitude of gamma of tau times the real part, which would be the cosine of phi of tau, which would be the cosine of two pi nu zero tau plus alpha of tau. And then we're assuming that the alpha of tau and the magnitude of gamma of tau vary quite slowly. And therefore, this would define fringes that would have a period determined by this variation here. So uh, tau, when it increases by 1 over nu 0, that would cause the argument of the cosine to change by 2 pi. And so the period would be delta tau is 1 over nu 0. The corresponding delta h, again where tau is 2h over c, would be equal to lambda 0 over 2, half a wavelength, as we've seen before. H is C tau over 2. And then the max detector intensity would be 2I0. And so this cosine for certain values of tau would have a value of 1. And so this would be 1 plus the absolute value of gamma of tau. And the min would be when the cosine would be minus 1. So that would be 2 I0, 1 minus the absolute value of gamma of tau. And so the fringe visibility, let's see. So you'd have the difference of these. So the 2 I0s would cancel. You get 2 I0 magnitude gamma of tau minus minus the same thing. So 4 I0 magnitude gamma tau over the sum, which would be 2i0 plus 2i0, 4i0, 4i0 is cancel. This just leaves magnitude of gamma of tau. And so we see uh, the physical significance of the complex degree of coherence is that its magnitude is the visibility of the fringes, which we're using to define what we call the temporal coherence of the source. If V is equal to 1, it's perfectly coherent v is equal to zero, it's incoherent. If it varies with tau, then the coherence properties would be such that for certain tau times, it would appear to be very highly coherent. And for larger tau times where v approaches zero, it would become effectively incoherent. And so we're going to use this to define the so-called coherence time and coherence length of a quasi-monochromatic light source. Now, here's our complex degree of coherence, gamma of tau. We can write it as, here we're going to do our time average integral, g of t plus tau, g conjugate of t, dt. So that's going to be like our big gamma of tau, and then we normalize that by gamma of zero, which would be the, the same integral when tau is equal to zero. So that's just the integral over time of magnitude g of t squared. The ratio of those, then, is our little gamma of tau. And now this integral magnitude squared of g of t by Parseval's theorem, we studied and we talked about two-dimensional uh, linear systems, magnitude uh, of g of t uh, squared dt is equal to the same integral in the frequency domain, magnitude of g of nu, big G of nu squared d nu. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And now let's look at the numerator. And let's take a Fourier transform of it. So we'll do an integral of, here's the function, g of t plus 
tau g conjugate of t um, dt, and there's, a, there's an integral there. Let me make that clear. Okay, so that's your numerator. And we're doing a Fourier transform, so we multiply by e to the i 2 pi nu tau and integrate d tau. So what does that look like? Well, let's see. We can uh, rearrange that into the form integral of g of t plus tau e to the i 2 pi nu t plus tau d tau times the integral of g conjugate of t e to the minus i 2 pi nu t dt. Let's see, here's our g of t plus tau, here's our g conjugate of t, and then we wrote e to the i 2 pi nu tau as, well here you got the e to the i 2 pi nu tau, but you also have a nu t, but then this one cancels the nu t, okay? And then you got integrations over t and tau. And so now let's define tau plus t to be a new variable, say s, And for a fixed value of t, then, uh, ds would be equal to d tau. Okay, so what is this? Well, this is just, then, the Fourier transform of g of s. g of s, e to, e to the i 2 pi nu s ds. Okay, so that would just be big G of nu. And this would be the same thing. If we forget the conjugate here, g of t, e to the, forget the minus, e to the i 2 pi nu t dt, that would be g of nu, but then it's got a conjugate here, and then the minus sign means this is a conjugate, so that whole thing is just the conjugate of g of nu, which is the magnitude squared of g of nu. And so we see that the Fourier transform of the complex degree of coherence, little gamma of tau, is the magnitude of g of nu squared over this denominator, which is the integral of that same thing. And we define that to be s of nu, the normalized power spectrum of the source. Normalized in the sense that the, the integral of s and nu d nu over all frequencies is equal to 1 because of this denominator. So we see that by measuring the complex degree of coherence, gamma of tau, and then a Fourier transform of that will give us the normalized power spectrum. And so this is one of the applications of the Michelson interferometer we'll talk about in another lecture, and that is so-called Fourier transform spectroscopy, how we can actually measure the power spectrum of an arbitrary optical source. A normalized power spectrum model uh, representing a so-called Gaussian line uh, is a pretty good model for many optical sources. And so this would be where S of nu would be 1 over delta nu e to the minus pi nu minus nu zero over delta nu quantity squared. Uh, this one over delta nu here makes this normalized right, so that the integral s of nu d nu is equal to one. And recalling that um, e, e to the minus pi tau squared for he transforms to e to the minus pi nu squared in frequency we can work out the inverse for you transform of this it will be gamma of tau is e to the minus pi delta nu tau squared that's from the scaling theorem with the uh, 1 over delta nu squared here and then a shift theorem, because of the nu minus nu zero, gives us a factor e to the minus i 
two pi nu zero tau. So that would be the complex degree of coherence for a Gaussian line. And the interferogram or the intensity at the output of the Michelson interferometer then would be two I zero. Notice by the way here um, that the uh, magnitude of gamma of tau is less than or equal to one. Magnitude of this of course is one. And this is at tau is equal to zero is equal to one and then smaller for other values of tau. So this would be um, two I zero, one plus e to the minus pi delta nu tau quantity squared, and then real part of the exponential would give of the complex exponential would give you cosine two pi nu zero tau. The visibility, which now is a function of tau, would be okay. So again, when the cosine is equal to one, you get the biggest value. Cosine is minus one, you get the smallest value. Take the difference of biggest minus smallest over their sum. And what you get is, it's just equal to the magnitude of gamma of tau, which is e to the minus t delta nu tau quantity squared. And so this looks something like the following. There's zero. So let's just sketch out the envelope there. And we would see oscillations like this this would be your 2i0 and so we would have a highly coherent type of behavior for small tau in fact I don't know what's the overall width of this it would be Basically, one over delta tau, roughly. Uh, I'm sorry, one over delta nu, roughly, would be the the width of this in the along the tau axis. So, if if magnitude of tau was much less than this, then we would have highly coherent behavior. We'd go all the way from almost zero intensity to a very large intensity. So the visibility would be close to one, right? When tau is much less than one over delta nu. And for tau much greater than that, well, then we get very little in the way of interference fringes, and it would behave more or less incoherently. So we'd have this transition from highly coherent eventually to more or less incoherent. We define the coherence time of a source. Uh, in general, by the expression tau sub c is by definition the integral over all tau of the magnitude of tau quantity squared d tau. And for this this function here, right, to square that, you get a e to the minus two pi delta tau uh, delta nu tau squared, and you can integrate that and find that uh, for the Gaussian beam, the coherence time is one over the square root of 2 times delta nu. So we take that to be a measure of kind of the, the time delay between the two arms of the interferometer for which you get strong interference fringes, coherent-like interference patterns. And for delays much greater than that, you'll get very weak interference fringes, a more incoherent type of behavior. Related to the coherence time is the coherence length. L sub c, which is the speed of light, c times the coherence time tau c. And this is just simply the distance traveled by light 
in a time tau c. Now, for a source with frequency nu zero, the wavelength lambda zero is c over nu zero. So if we have a range of frequencies, delta nu, we're going to get a range of wavelengths, delta lambda, which is the magnitude of, well, d lambda d nu is going to be minus c over nu zero squared. This is nu to the minus one, derivative is minus uh, nu to the minus two. And then we have a range of frequencies delta nu. And so from that, let's take a look here at delta lambda over lambda zero. Okay, so that's going to be delta lambda is C delta nu over nu zero squared. That's your delta lambda. Now one over lambda zero is going to be nu zero over C, nu zero over C. The C's cancel. One of the delta zeros cancels, and that just leaves delta nu over nu zero. So we call this the fractional bandwidth of the source. We can all either describe it as the range of frequencies over the center frequency, delta nu over nu zero, or the range of wavelengths over the center wavelength, delta lambda over lambda zero. For a Gaussian beam, the coherence length is going to be speed of light, c, times the coherence time. We already showed that was 1 over the square root of 2 delta nu. And let's multiply top and bottom by nu zero. Then this is equal to, let's see, well, c over nu zero, that's lambda zero. And let's pull out this square root of two, so lambda zero over the square root of two. And that leaves then nu zero over delta nu. Well, nu zero over delta nu would be equal to lambda zero over delta lambda. So this would be times lambda zero over delta lambda. So there's a formula for our coherence length. As an example, a particular red light emitting diode or LED from the spec sheet has lambda zero is 780 nanometers, that's red light, and a range of frequencies delta lambda of about two nanometers. So what would the coherence length be? It would be lambda zero, 780 nanometers over the square root of two times lambda zero over delta lambda, which would be 780 nanometers over 2 nanometers. Punch those numbers, and you get 220 microns, uh, or 0 0.22 millimeters. So this LED, say you wanted to use this LED to make a hologram. Well, you would have to ensure that the dip path difference between the beams that you want to interfere in your holographic system are much less than about a fifth of a millimeter, which is not very much. So this would not be useful as a coherent source um, for making holograms. Instead, you'd have to use like a laser diode rather than a LED. Uh, but there could be other applications where having this very relatively small coherence length might be useful, and we'll see that in a future lecture.